morning. Yes, come on, you've got to be cheery, not because I'm speaking, but the sun is out, right? You've got good plans for the rest of the day? They involve ice cream at some point? You disappoint me already, what's going on? My daughter Ella has just headed off to see Taylor Swift this evening. She gave me a pop quiz of 10 questions about Taylor Swift the other day. Uh, and as a youth worker, I'm proud to say I scored two. Uh, doesn't bode well. So uh, thank you for reading for us, Emily and Helen. Thank you for leading us so really clearly and well and brilliantly in our service. And here we are at this passage that we've read. Sorry, let me just switch. Sorry, Tim. Realize I was forgetting to hold this. Let's talk about this passage that we've read that I think will be familiar to most of you. It's a familiar story. Martin Luther King said about the church, it's not the place you come to, it's the place you go from. What he was saying was that the service here today isn't the destination. This is where we come, but it's not where we stay. Yes, it's a place of worship and love and community, but we are not meant to live out our Christian lives within these four walls. The church is also the departure point from which we are to go, to love, to serve, to make disciples. This is why I believe church seats have traditionally been so uncomfortable. You are meant to be uncomfortable. You're not meant to be settled. We are to go. So I want to take a few minutes, and I promise it'll just be a few minutes this morning, to look at this story in Mark 5. Because I think in this encounter, believe it or not, there's actually a huge amount for us about the challenge of what it means to go. So verse 1, I don't know whether you caught it, verse 1 of the chapter that Emily read just says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. There is so much in that one sentence that is easy to miss. I mean, I don't know about you, you read it, right, and you think, yeah, this is just the intro to the passage, right? You just skip by it. But the gospel writer is doing so much with this sentence, so brilliantly, so subversively. What's the big deal? It just says they went across the lake, right? Well, let's back up to the beginning of Mark's gospel, because this is chapter 5. But in chapter 1, it says that Jesus was at the synagogue, then in chapter 2, Jesus was in Capernaum, which was a small fishing village on the east side, of, on the west shore of Galilee. Then later in chapter 2, he goes out beside the lake and something happens on a Sabbath. Then in chapter 3, Jesus went into the synagogue again. Later in the same chapter, Jesus withdrew to his, with his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed. And in chapter 4 again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. So, synagogue, Capernaum, out by the lake, Sabbath, synagogue, lake, large crowd from Galilee. So far in Mark's gospel, Jesus is spending his time essentially in a small area on the west side of the lake of Galilee. And he's spending it among orthodox Jewish people a lot like him. He's kind of hanging out with his tribe. That's why there's all the mentions of Sabbath and synagogue. This is about a story unfolding in a particular space, in a particular place among a very particular group of people. And then you get this line at the beginning of Mark 5. They went across the lake. Now, the reason I go through all this is that because going across the lake 
was basically leaving one world and entering another. What the storyteller, Mark, is doing very subtly is saying that Jesus and his disciples left the familiar, the known, the comfortable. They left their small, tightly knit Jewish world and they went over to a very, very different world. And I guess the early readers of this story, maybe not us, would have immediately understood what a big deal that was. So, sorry, little bit of geography, little bit of history, bear with. On the other side of the lake, the east side was the region of the Gerasenes. Gerasenes comes from the word Gerasa, which is one of 10 cities on that other side of the lake. And the, the region was usually called the Decapolis. Kind of get the Latin or Greek, Greek or whatever is coming out of that. These 10 cities, again, apologies, this is not the rest is history. I promise to come back in a moment to this. But these 10 cities were established by Alexander the Great. And they had a very strong, he was Greek, and he ruled the world before the Romans. And they had a very strong Greek influence. They were much more Greek than Jewish in religion, in culture, in food. So they ate pork, for example, which is why there's a herd of pigs on the lake. But we will come back, trust me, to the pigs. More about them in a moment. And they worship Greek gods. So anyone growing up on the west side of Galilee in a tight-knit Orthodox Jewish community, this was literally, if they went across, another world. Maybe they'd been to Jerusalem once or twice for a Jewish feast. But otherwise, they had probably ne never left the place where they were born, let alone go to the Decapolis. And suddenly at the start of chapter 5, Jesus says to his disciples, let's go over the other side of the lake. This was a huge step for them from the safe, familiar world they knew into somewhere completely different. I wonder if Jesus is saying to us this morning as a church, let's go over the other side of the lake. Up until now, maybe your Christian life has been hanging out with your tribe. Church, Sunday, worship, communion, home group, church, Sunday, worship. But beyond these walls is another community that is so far from us, it might as well be across a lake. They have no knowledge or interest in the songs we sing or the prayers we pray or the bread we break. If they notice the church at all, they see a failed and out-of-date institution that speaks in incomprehensible words that might as well be another language. But Jesus is saying to us, I believe as a church, I think we've sensed that this year, Let's go over to the other side of the lake, out of the familiar and the safe and the known and the predictable. And he's calling us as a church to go with him. In 2013, the day before the 120 cardinals went into the conclave to choose the next pope, Jorge Bergoglio, who was to become Pope Francis, said, Jesus is standing at the door of the church knocking asking to be let out. Let's go over to the other side of the lake. I wonder if there's a part of you deep down that yearns for more in your Christian life than this. You love the worship and you value the community, but even so, there's this itch, this sense that your faith is domesticated and tame, that there's a journey you need to take, an adventure beyond these walls, into the community beyond. So off they go, across the lake. And remember, Galilee is huge. It's 13 miles long and seven miles wide, which is why it's sometimes called the Sea of Galilee. But whilst they're doing that, and before they have this encounter with the man on the other side, there's a bit more we need to know about where they're going. So should we just, we'll get them in the boat in your mind. Let's let them head across and leave them for a second. They'll get to the other side in a moment and just have one other bit of conversation. 
a lot of what we know about this first century Jewish world is from a brilliant writer and historian called Josephus. Sorry, again, apologies for turning into the rest is history. He wrote a huge number of books in detail about the time, including a huge compendium called War. And he describes in that book something that took place just before the story we're reading here in Mark. Just before. There's an uprising against the Romans in Gerasa. And a Roman general, Vespasian, sends a commander and a legion of Roman soldiers to put it down. Remember, the Romans have invaded the whole region, and they're brutal. And they take back the city almost immediately. But the first thing they do when they've reestablished control is slaughter a thousand young men in the town square as revenge. They take all the women and children of Gerasa into slavery. They allow the soldiers to pillage anything they want from the homes. And then they burn the houses to the ground and massacre anyone else they find in the surrounding villages. And you can only imagine in the wake of that sort of trauma and tragedy you can only imagine the aftermath of something like that, right? And Mark is, I think, subtly referring to that in the first verse. You see, normally the name for this is the Decapolis. That's the ten cities. But Mark doesn't use that name in verse 1. He refers to it in kind of an odd way as the region of the Gerasenes. But everyone reading at that time would be like, oh, Gerasenes, Gerasa, yeah, right. I know what happened there. So, let's talk about the man they meet as soon as they arrive on the shore on the west side. What do we know about him? We know he's in deep trauma. He cuts himself. He self-harms. That's how people deal with overwhelming pain. We've been working at Youthscape with young people who self-harm for 15 years. And I know that in many, many cases, the reason you cut yourself is to deal, to respond to. It's not a cry for help. It's to respond to overwhelming pain in your life. And he's crying out. The pain is so great. Whatever he's been through, it's so awful that he's literally screaming with the pain of it. So you've got to wonder what happened to him. Did he watch his 14 or 15-year-old son get slaughtered by the Romans in the town square? Did he see his wife and young children bundled away into slavery? never going to see them again, never going to know if they're alive or dead? Did he f flee for his own life into the hills? And what does that kind of ordeal do to you? I find it hard to believe. I don't know for sure, but I just find it hard to believe there isn't some kind of link. I'd always assume reading this that when it talks about him crying out, it was the demon within him, but I don't think it is. I think it's his pain. And what do the people around him do with someone in that kind of trauma? How do they respond? How do they help? They bind him up. They imprison him. They put him in a graveyard among the dead. In other words, they write him off and put him out the way where they won't have to see him. We are still, by the way, doing that to people as a society today. Visit any prison and I don't know whether you have, it's a traumatic experience, I can tell you. And you'll meet people who have done terrible things, but who also have the most terrible trauma in their lives. But somehow as a society, we don't seem to know what to do with them. We put them out the way. 
Back to the story, because this man is not just traumatized by his past. Just think about it. His needs are bigger than that. He's homeless. He's destitute. He doesn't even have enough money for clothes. He has no job, no means of income. And of course, the biggest thing of all, he's spiritually oppressed. Demonic forces have got a grip on him. So this is not straightforward. He has all kinds of needs. What I really want to do is help us begin to see this man, not just as the protagonist in the story, but as a human being. You don't just suddenly become someone violently restrained among the tombs, oppressed by evil forces. There's a story behind that. Like there's a story behind all pain and dysfunction. The worst behaved boy in a school I visited in Luton, aged 11, out of control, chairs thrown during lessons, is also the boy whose mother is an alcoholic and would lock him out on the balcony of their flat in the high rises in Parktown, whose father was in Bedford prison. And the more you see that, the more this scary, out-of-control teenager becomes a vulnerable, broken child. Jesus always sees the vulnerable child. Do you notice the first thing Jesus does when he meets this man? He asks him his name. Now, because we're reading the story and we know the demon's reply, I've always assumed he's talking directly to the demons. But now I'm not so sure. I don't think he is. I think he's talking to the man, asking his name. Weirdo, freak, psycho. I imagine people refer to this man in all kinds of derogatory ways, many of which I can't use here, standing up in front of you in this morning. They saw the problem, but the first thing Jesus does is ask him his name, because he's got a name, right? It might not have been used for years. If we go, if we dare to go to the other side of the lake, our first task is to see those we meet not as problems to be fixed, but as human beings known and loved by God. The gospel sees people as individuals. Immigrants, alcoholics, gang members. It's the opposite of those who try and make people into others. If you begin to see people not as individuals, but as some amorphous group, you begin to dehumanize them. But Jesus asked them his name. Matthew by the way, is the name of that boy in Parktown, aged 11. The families living in your street who you've yet to speak to have names. The young person loitering in a hoodie by the shops where you shop has a name. The Afghan man who doesn't make eye contact with you living in a bed sit round the corner has a name. What if we as a church weren't just the people who try and persuade those around us, wherever we live in Luton or beyond, to come to a service or some activity? What if the starting point for our mission was to be the people known for seeing beyond the clutter, the clutter and chaos and brokenness of people's lives and see them as human beings? What if that's what we were known for? If people in our community have any expectation about us as Christians, it's that we will judge them, right? Look down on them. And, be, and to be honest with you, that is true sometimes, shamefully. The church has been judgmental. But I'm convinced that we will never make a difference unless we can learn to follow Jesus in the radical way he sees people. If you can't make that step, no one is going to listen. So back to the story. And it's not the man who answers, but these evil spirits who've got a grip on him. And they answer, my name is 
legion. Did you notice that? Of all the terms that these demons could use to describe themselves, they choose a Roman military term. Legion was like we would call battalion or squadron. Is that a coincidence? Do you see perhaps the connection now, knowing what we know? But there's something else I want you to notice. I want you to notice in this story that we've read, the power of Jesus to meet this man's needs. Perhaps we shouldn't need reminded, but we do. Jesus is more powerful than the demonic forces. The trauma, the poverty, the emptiness, the pain they've brought, as much as they have ruled this man's life. They are confronted by someone who has power over all these things. Jesus, the cross and the resurrection, these have changed forever. The power of these demonic forces and of all the brokenness and emptiness of the world. I'm not suggesting everyone we meet in the community will be dealing with all these things. But let's not forget what people in our community are living with. The anxiety about making ends meet, keeping a roof over your family's head, zero hours contracts, prices rising every time you visit the supermarket or a bill arrives. The isolation so many people feel. Young people who are more connected technically than any other generation through their phones and now, believe it or not, the age group suffering with the deepest sense of loneliness in this country. The fear of being exposed or cancelled. Knowing the person you present yourself is not who you really are. The terror of wars in distant lands that come closer and closer. A climate crisis that might end it all anyway. But all of these, all of these fall in submission to Jesus. He's bigger than the anxiety and the isolation, and the fear, and the terror. We have good news. I'm convinced that if we really understood how good the good news is, we'd be out the door. That you are truly seen. That you are truly known. That you are loved. That you've got a reason to live. That there's someone who knows your fears. There's someone who knows your secrets and the distance between what you present yourself to be and what you know yourself to be. That there is strength and joy and life. And you are not on your own in this big frightening world. And however wonderfully they sang it in Stockwood Park, Coldplay cannot fix you. But Jesus will cross a lake to come and find you. Back to the story. And notice what has changed about this man now he's met Jesus. Unbound, no longer screaming, sitting. His trauma is being healed. He has clothes, thank goodness. His practical needs are being met. This is the power of the gospel to meet all your needs. And look at what happens now this man has been restored. He asked Jesus if he can join his training program. Did he notice this? He says, can I come with you and learn more and hang out with you? Can I become a disciple like the rest of you? He's right there by the lake just as they're getting in their boat to head back. And what does Jesus say? No. What he does instead is say to the man, look, go tell your people what I've done for you. Tell them about the mercy God has shown them. Just tell them your story. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends, tell the people at the market. You're ready, you can do it. It's as if Jesus has more faith in the man than he has in himself. We talk, don't we, about having faith in Jesus, but have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus has faith in you? You've got this. Just go and share your story. You don't need to have a theological education to get started. It's about your lived experience of healing and grace and mercy. This man is literally two minutes into his faith and Jesus is telling him to go. We are ready right now in our imperfect state as a church to go across the lake. 
So there's a final twist. One last thing about this story that we should notice. Let's go back to the moment that Jesus healed the man and the spirits run into the pigs and they in turn fling themselves off a cliff to be drowned. Apologies to the pig lovers among you at this point. Do you notice it says that the pig herders run into the town and then a bunch of people come up and plead with Jesus to leave? You see how deep the despair is, right? You see how dark the cloud is oppressing these people. The despair is so great that when healing and liberation come, they're terrified of it. The shame, the humiliation, the horror have set into such a degree they've become entrenched to the point where being freed is alarming. I've seen that in young people because of the the work I do, caught up in crazy stuff, heading the wrong way, and they see this possible ability of rescue, but it's too much, it's too scary, and so they choose to stay where they are. But now, let's flip forward to Mark 7. Don't have to look this up, but in Mark 7, Jesus goes back to Decapolis again. This time he heals a man born deaf who could hardly speak. He heals him. There's hope. But look what happens this time around. Verse 36 and verse 37 of Mark 7. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it, people were overwhelmed with amazement. He's done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So instead of saying, go away... They want more. They're open. They're excited. I wonder what's changed between Mark 5 and Mark 7. I like to think it's down to the man from the tombs. He's been sharing his story, just like Jesus told him to, just telling people what happened to him. And, you know, maybe that's changed people change their minds and open their hearts. Leslie Newbegin, one of our great theologians, says the moment of the Great Commission is not at the end of Matthew. It's Jesus' words at the Last Supper in John 12, where he says, where I am, my servant will be also. Where is Jesus now? Jesus is already at work in our community. He's already out there. The question as a church is, will we follow? Will we cross the lake? Where I am, my servant also will be. Let's pray together. I just wonder how that has landed with you. Just take a moment to hold that challenge of across the lake. The beautiful way Jesus sees this man, the power of the cross and the resurrection, the command to simply go, Lord, we have nice chairs here. They're comfortable. I pray we would not get comfortable. We love this community and the warmth and the fellowship it brings is precious. Your community is precious. But we do not want to spend the rest of our Christian lives within these four walls. Stir our hearts as individuals and as a church to look into our community and take the scary wide leap across the lake to find you at work. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.